Hi everybody, uh, welcome to uh, Creating Wildlife Havens at Cumbria Wildlife Trust. Um, I'm Joe and uh, I'll just go through a few things. It's a bit of a funny one because I can't actually see uh, me or any of you lot So uh, because of, of the way we've had to do the sharing the screen. So, um, so you can see me but I can't see you so I'm just going to be talking to my slides as they go through. Um, You'll notice on the uh, right hand side of your screen, there's a there's a place where you can um, ask questions. So if you've got any problems or you need anything sorted out, Andrea and Mel are both uh, at hand to to try to help. Uh, if you've got any problems or if you want to ask any questions, which hopefully we'll get some time to answer uh, come the end. And um, you can make the chat bit smaller and make the slides bigger by clicking on the little line in the top right uh, that minimizes the chat and also you can minimize my face at the top of the screen as well um, so so you can appreciate the nice slides and not have to look at me right well i'll launch straight in so um this is a funny one because i've not i haven't done one of these before um so welcome um i'm going to give you an overview of cumbria wildlife trust's nature reserves uh, a bit about the history, the history of the trust, uh, and then we're going to take a bit of a virtual tour around the county, uh, visiting a few different nature reserves, a few different habitats, and explaining about why our reserves are really important, why they manage them um, like we do, and then uh, bring it right up to date with things that have been happening over the past uh, year or so. At the Wildlife Trust. So, um, the trust's been going for for 58 years nearly uh, now just short of 58 years that's 14,000 members over 50 staff and 43 uh, or so nature reserves is spending it on uh, depending on how you count them um we work in three main areas the standing up for wildlife and um, looking at uh, projects in the wider countryside standing up for wildlife across the board in land that we don't manage ourselves we're inspiring people and getting people involved in uh, nature conservation and inspiring people about um, the natural world uh, through volunteering and education. And then the Creating Wildlife Havens, which is my side of the trust, uh, which is basically acquiring and managing uh, nature reserves. Um, so I've been with the trust for 18 years uh, and 13 of those have been working on reserves. Um, so we'll go straight into it. So it could be argued that um, the first nature reserve in Cumbria could be South Walney. Uh, South Walney uh, in 1878, the Duke of Buccleu, um employed a watcher to protect the gulls and the gulls nests. One, because they were taking the eggs, but protecting, their, uh, protecting the gulls from other people. And uh, South Walney happens to be one of the first reserves that the Lake District Nationalist Trust, which we started out as, took over in the first place uh, in 1962 when it was jointly managed by Lancashire, because of course it was in Lancashire uh, in those days. Um, and the, the nature reserve movement um, as, as the Wildlife Trust re really started for um, as the Society for the Pr Promotion of Nature Reserves and was started by Charles Rothschild in 1915. The Society for the Promotion of Nature Reserves is really the forerunner to uh, the wildlife trusts across the country. Um, and, and one of the first places Rothschild um, put onto his list as one of the most interesting places in England was Meathop Moss. And Meathop is obviously is one of our reserves. Um, and Rothschild uh, on those original lists uh, like I said, uh, he said it was one of the most interesting places in England. And he mentions the specific species that are typical to the bog that we still have there today. So hopefully that means we're doing the right thing, including uh, uh, the large heath butterfly. There was a big gull colony on Meathop as well at that time. Now, he tried to buy the site in 1919, um, but couldn't and ended up leasing it. And the lease uh, moved to us when the Cumbria Wildlife Trust was first set up. And we finally managed to buy it. Uh, and it became ours in 1998. Um, and that's the original citation from uh, from his list, Rothschild's list. Um, th 
this shows uh, a bit of, of the distribution around Cumbria of our nature reserves. Uh, I've got the three new ones roughly banged in in, uh, in red there. So you can see Lowick Common down here. And um, I've got a cursor there. Icot Hill over there and the brand new Bowber Head over near Kirby Stephen. And you can see that uh, historically we don't really have a lot of nature reserves within the National Park or within the um, the North Pennines. And that, I think that's a historical thing, a lot based around Kendall, because that was what a lot of our activity was in the early days when we were gifted a lot of reserves. Um, as you can see, this is a rough estimate of um, reserves by area. So a huge proportion of our reserves uh, is coastal because mainly because of number five up there because of Rockcliffe Marsh. But we also own uh, and manage large areas of Maya, large areas of woodland, large areas of grassland. And this bar chart gives you uh, an idea as to um, the size of the reserves. And so we have very few, very only one very large reserve over 500 hectares, a few um, larger reserves but uh, many uh, and again this is a historical uh, thing from being given lots of small pieces of land when we first set it off we've got quite a lot of small reserves not uh, to 10 hectares and uh, we are one of um, 46 trusts in the uk uh, between us we have um, 850,000 members we manage uh, nearly two and a half thousand nature reserves covering more than 98,500 hectares. And Cumbria is one of the, the few trusts, one of only seven or so trusts with over 3,000 hectares of land managed by ourselves. And the unusual thing about Cumbria, and one of the great things about Cumbria is that 95% of by area of our reserves are nationally important and 90% uh, by area of our reserves are actually internationally important. Um, so what I propose to do is we're going to have a quick, um, this talk, by the way, uh, just gets longer and longer all the time because I kind of can't call things out and we're always doing new things so it gets bigger. So I'm going to have to rush through some of the slides and hopefully um, uh, um, still keep in all of the content that I want to. So we're going to have a, a quick look around. We're going to have a look at a couple of coastal sites, a couple of bogs a couple of grassland sites and a couple of woodland sites, all different, all in different parts of the county. And what I'll do is I'll explain how we manage them, why we manage them, some of the restoration work we've done, some of the new things that have been coming on and some of the new developments that are going to happen. So we're going to start with uh, Falney Island. Uh, Falney Island is seven and a half hectares. If you've never been, it's uh, it's cut off by the tide, high tide um, uh, each time. So it's, uh, it's quite remote. It's down um, off Barrow. Uh, it was originally owned by the Duke of Buccleuch. In fact, it is owned by the Duke of Buccleuch and we lease it from them. Uh, and as its name suggests, it's got a long history of uh, uh, connected to seabirds. Uh, it was connected to the, it was an island originally and then connected to the mainland in 1890 by a causeway. And since 1963, we've employed a seasonal warden who sits out there to monitor and look after the birds. Um, and these are the main interests. The main interests of, uh, of Fowley is its breeding terns. Uh, and it's always been good for terns. It formerly, in the 1960s, it had five species of tern. Um, so that's Arctic, Common, Little, Sandwich, and Roseate. It hasn't had those uh, for a long time, mainly the four species. And these days, just two species. Um, Arctic terns, which is the only place that it breeds, uh, that they breed in Cumbria, but also one of the few uh, last places for breeding little tern. And I think a lot of that is to do because of the constant problem with uh, disturbance and predation that they get in their breeding habitats. Um, what do we do? We put a warden out there and the warden tries to look after the, uh, the nest, the individual nest. You can see one numbered up here. Um, we, um, we try to protect the nests with electric fence, uh, with these little nest cages that stop the big uh, gulls getting in. Uh, we try to manage the people. So we put a rope down the middle of the island to try to keep people to the middle of the island and, and not wander off uh, and disturb uh, nests. Um, and we've been doing some uh, big habitat management work there recently with turf stripping, trying to uh, create more turn nesting habitat where um, 
uh, where, where we've got rank grassland over the top of the site. Now, here's a, uh, there's a couple of graphs, not a lot of graphs, but there's a few graphs. Uh, and you can see here um, were uh, little turns. Um, here they favoured Falny, here they went away, and here they favoured Falny again. And they actually swap quite uh, en masse between Falny and between Hodbarrow, which is the RSPB reserve, over um, at uh, near Millen. So uh, as you can see here, we've had some fantastic years. We had some very lean years, uh, and I think this was when they went to, uh, to Hodbarrow, and then we had some really good years here. Um, a lot of that depends on how well we do in terms of productivity. Now, this graph is a little bit confusing, but I, I just wanted to put this on to show that it's not necessarily about the number. Of, uh, the, the previous graph was about this is numbers of pairs that are bred each year. And here we've got 60 odd uh, getting towards uh, 70 pairs um, making nests and breeding. But that's no good if they don't actually produce any chicks. And you can see here, this is a graph that shows that even when uh, we have a uh, good nesting um, numbers, if the productivity isn't there, if the chicks don't survive to fledge and to get away, then it's a bit of a, a poor year. So so uh, it's it's a constant battle between trying to create, um, to get the, the, the turns to nest, but then to be able to make sure that they can uh, uh, then get away, fledge and, and fly away. Um, We've had some success recently and we've had some poor days. Uh, this is actually a little turn nest on South Walney and uh, little turns ret returned to South Walney um, for the first time in 33 years, uh, two years ago. Um, when they, uh, and, and they've been nesting there ever since. And in fact, um, this year, um, we only had three, uh, two pairs fledged. Two pairs fledged, they got three young away which is a productivity of 1.5 chicks per pair, which meant the best productivity of any little turn site in the country. I know that's not particularly good when we only have three pairs, but it's good that we got three away. And here you can see some of the problems we have uh, here down the bottom is the little turn nest, uh, this tiny little scrape with the two eggs in, and that is an illegal quad bike track that's just gone right next to them and luckily, very luckily uh, missed the nest. So we still have lots of problems. Um, and uh, there's some very cute uh, little turn chicks uh, from the beach at South Walney. Uh, we also have breeding eiders on Falney, and uh, breeding eiders um, have had a, a, a bit of a, a problem with the population. This is where, uh, where the furthest uh, southern southerly population on the west coast of Britain. I think there's the odd pair breeds below us, but as a large colony. Uh, this area um, uh, is, is the furthest south on the, on the west coast. And um, and we used to have up to 300 pairs breeding on Falney, and that hasn't gone very well lately. And we do wonder whether that's to do with them, um, not just to do with the, um, the disturbance, but also to do with the females being able to feed up properly. And there's also been a, a bit of a gender mismatch between males and females across the bay uh, over the past few years. But we did have 46 chicks uh, fledged uh, and got away in 2018. 2020 hasn't been a good year for us because of COVID. Uh, we haven't been able to put anybody out on these uh, on these uh, sites. So we haven't actually got any numbers for this year. And without a warden um, on Falney looking at after these birds, this is one that uh, actually nested underneath the caravan where the warden stays, then it's very difficult um, uh, to, to make sure that the birds uh, hatch eggs and, and fledge properly. Um, as you can see here, this is just to show that Falney is not just about birds. So there's the caravan where the warden stays. And then uh, Falney is also uh, a, a nationally important and internationally important site for its vegetated shingle. And you can see how beautifully flower rich it is in the summer. Uh, like I said, uh, we put a warden out there. This is the warden's caravan um, you can see tightly fastened down to the ground so it doesn't blow away. And uh, and this was just to show you how dramatic and how difficult it can be to live out on Falney. This was in 2018 before the drought and this was in 2018 during the drought. So uh, it's quite a, an inhospitable place. Um, right, we're going to move right up to the north of the county and I pointed out Rockcliffe Marsh. Uh, Rockcliffe Marsh uh, is 
uh, our largest nature reserve at 100 hectares and it accounts for um, getting on towards a third of the hectareage of, of, of all our nature reserves. It's probably the best site in northwest England uh, for its breeding waders and it's as you can see it's really really not one for the agrophobic it's absolutely huge with these massive massive skies um, and again we put a person out there um, to look after the birds and to do the monitoring and again it's one of these sites where we've got fantastic um, data going back all the way uh, to the early 60s and like Fowney it's it's a um, a, uh, an internationally important and nationally important site, both for its um, breeding birds in the summer, but also for its wintering birds. And you get these huge numbers of barnacle geese uh, feeding on here in the winter. Uh, another quick graph uh, you can see. So that's from 1969 all the way up to 2019. And you can see that even though the birds have their fluctuations, that the general trend is that they're all doing okay. These are the three big ones that we try to uh, keep an eye on, oyster catcher, lapwing, and red shank. Now we're having a little problem here with oyster catcher at the moment, and we don't really understand why that is. Um, and like I said, it's one of the best places for breeding waders in, in Northwest England. And I'm pretty damn sure that that's due to the lack of disturbance because it, uh, it really doesn't have, um, well, uh, we don't allow visitors to it. Um, uh, this is a lapwing chick. Lapwing, um, like the, the other two species, they also have, have seen a 50% decline in total population numbers uh, since the mid 80s and late 90s. And, and, and they've almost disappeared from, from many areas. So all three of these species are red listed now on the birds of conservation concern. And, and um, lapwing, uh, Rockcliffe has an average between 100, uh, 80 and 100 pairs annually. Uh, so the largest breeding po uh, colony in, in Cumbria. And like I said, I'm sure this is due to, to the lack of disturbance. And um, it's also uh, a brilliant site for its skylarks. And uh, I'm sure you know as well that skylark uh, has also suffered a f an over 50% decline since the 1970s and is now a red listed species. And, uh, and it's been doing really well on Rockcliffe Marsh. Uh, this may have been an anomaly up here, but we did have, that was 2018, we did have a fantastic uh, year in terms of breeding uh, climate and uh, they can be uh, second and even third brooded. So um, that could have been why we, uh, uh, we got, or it could have been um, observer error, but we did have the most <laughs> phenomenal uh, numbers of skylarks. Uh, like I said, they're probably under recorded, if, um, if anything, because of this double or triple brooding. And it's possibly, and I wouldn't like to uh, hazard a guess, but it's possibly the highest density of skylarks in England. Now, uh, I'm, we're going to go and uh, talk about a couple of um, peat bog sites. And we can't do anything uh, within talking about Cumbria Wildlife Trust Reserves without talking about Foulshaw, because Foulshaw i think has been one of the most phenomenal phenomenally successful projects that the reserves department has taken on uh, ever and and it's been the most brilliant success to turn um a forest uh, a forestry plantation desert into this fantastic uh, wildlife area uh, it's just it's been you know a huge example of uh, rewilding at its best now, we manage 17% of the peat bogs in Cumbria, of the lowland raised miles in Cumbria, and Foulshaw is 350 hectares of that. We acquired it in 1998 when it was completely covered in trees from one side, of the, uh, from, from one side to the other, and you could walk across Foulshaw uh, under the trees, under Western Hemlock mainly, without getting your feet wet. Uh, so we cleared, in the first um, part of the restoration, we cleared 195 hectares of conifers, and 15 hectares of dense rhododendron uh, and you can see that that's this this light area at this uh, bottom corner here um, and so um i was just going to take you through a bit of the the kind of things that we've been doing on Falshaw to turn what what like, like i said was was a complete wildlife desert into the fantastic wildlife site that it is that it is today so first of all we had to take the the rest of the trees off this is this great big fringe of uh, conifers uh, that we had to remove another 80 hectares of conifers 
plantation conifers from around the edge. Now, when I say we, I have to admit that it wasn't all me. Uh, it, um, you know, it, uh, this is all down to the reserves officers. Um, so 130 hectares uh, of conifers, uh, another 80 to remove. This was what, uh, what it was like. It was dark, there was nothing grew underneath it. It was mainly Western hemlock. It's uh, an invasive uh, non-native species. Um, and like I said before, the restoration, you could walk across Farshaw from one side to the other without getting your feet wet. Um, it was the most incredible um, logistical nightmare to try to get all this wood and all this tons and tons of timber off over this very deep peat. And uh, I mean, Falshaw uh, has got millions of tons of locked carbon uh, in the peat, up to seven meters deep in the, in the center of the bog. And what we wanted to do was to try, first of all, to get the trees off, to stop them transpiring and taking all the, the water out of the bog, then to block up the drains, then to try to uh, re-establish the hydrology so that the bog was getting wet and was getting wet again in the middle where it completely dried out. So these are the log roads that we had to run the vehicles across to be able to get all this tons of timber off. And we had a load of specialist kit. A lot of the timber paid for itself to get it off, even though it was quite a, uh, a like I said, a logistical nightmare with, with a lot of thought and effort having to get in to be able to, um, to do this work. Um, and here's one of the log roads that will eventually be incorporated into the peat. So this is what archaeologists will find in the future. Um, and this was taking um, huge amounts of timber back out to where the Falshaw car park is, is now. Um, and all good, all good planning. Uh, we did have the odd mishap. This was a, a, a machine that slipped into a, a hole. Uh, on meetup, luckily um, the driver was absolutely fine, but the machine, uh, I'm afraid, wasn't. Um, after we cleared all the trees off, then what we did was um, we, we, we tried to uh, make sure that the water wasn't running off Falshaw in the same way as it had been through these drains, but through these peak cut areas. So uh, Falshaw and Meathop have all been cut uh, around the edges for a uh, small scale uh, peat use uh, and uh, um, for, for many centuries. So you get these big peat cut faces and these uh, th these big drop offs, uh, which we had to try to repair. And uh, and we were at the cutting edge, the absolute cutting edge of um, peatland restoration in this respect, doing this by getting these machines on site, digging down into the deep good, uh, I can't point, can I? Uh, into this beautiful uh, anoxic gray uh, peat uh, fr from below and making buns through the uh, uh, oxidized layers of peat where, where the peat is, uh, where we're losing peat, losing peat into the estuary, losing peat into the atmosphere. Uh, and this is all to try to stop uh, the water uh, flowing off the site. And again, um, because we'd taken off a huge amount of timber, we had these massive root plates that the machines had to rip the root plates out just to be able to put the bunding through. Um, and here you can see, this is a reprofiled face of the peat. So where it would have been a great uh, straight cut edge, um, what we did was we reprofiled the edges so that they weren't uh, so severe and then bunded, bunded across the bottom, across the top, and then, and then across the middle um, to stem water flow. And here you can see uh, the bunding and the cells that were being created. And we've created hundreds and hundreds of these cells all around the edge of Falshaw and Meathop, and as you'll see in a minute on Drumbruff as well, all holding the water back and you can see uh, what a great job they did. And then the vegetation started to come back straight away. So um, even, even in the, um, that first growing season, you can see we've still got a problem. There's a bit of rhododendron down here and, and we're still getting trees coming back through. Um, but this was re-establishment of the original bog vegetation. We had some uh, incredible elite drivers. You can see here, this man has no bother about that he's, half his machine is actually in the bog, sat reading his paper uh, on his lunch break. Um, here uh, on, on some of the areas, uh, 
where we had secondary woodland growing around the edge of the bog, we put the bunding through the woodland. And if any of you have been to Falshaw and uh, and walked around the boardwalk, you can see this, where basically uh, we flooded out the woodland and it created this fantastic stands of beautiful um, dead wood and created uh, wonderful uh, lag, uh, fen and uh, wet woodland habitat. Um, on Meathop, it was a bit of a... Um, a different matter uh, we had to be uh, much more careful because Meathop had a proper bog surface it had proper bog vegetation on it so we tried to be uh, uh, much less destructive uh, and here you can see where the buns have been made and the deep peat has been um, taken and um, filled back in through the trenches and then the vegetation um, has been put back on top and here you can see uh, where the vegetation uh, has started to where the buns have even started to disappear and um, as the vegetation has come back so well and again here uh, this is proper true bog vegetation the, the the cotton grass and the sphagnums coming through like i said we do still have these problems with some of the non-natives and some of the natives uh coming in but hopefully we're getting it wet enough that none of these trees are going to uh, are going to establish for very long and um, the other thing we wanted to do was we wanted to try to um re-establish the bog edge and um, the, these bogs are, and uh, when they were first uh, designated uh, basically they, they're designated to the edge of the semi-natural vegetation then there's a ditch and then there's a field a field that's been drained uh, often reseeded it's had uh, fertilizer thrown on it and we get these hard edges where there would have been uh, lag uh, habitats wetland habitats fen type habitats and wet woodland habitats so what we wanted to do was we wanted to try to recreate those to soften the bog edges to create these habitats but also still trying to keep water back on the bog and we were able to do this by purchasing some of the fields around the edges of, of Falsher and Meathop and this is one that we did uh, down at Wolfer, uh, Ulfer at the southern edge of uh, Falsher and it's been a fantastic success uh, we turned um, uh, sheep uh, and silage fields uh, with no interest, no uh, natural um, wildlife interest whatsoever into beautiful wetland habitat and reconnected them um, to the bog. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been a fantastic success. It's shown what we what we were able to do. And uh, and this is uh, one of our one of the things we'd love to do in the future is get hold of more land around the edges and be able to wet more, uh, more of that land up and create wonderful wildlife habitat like this. Um, it's been superb and uh, we've even got wintering bitten down in some of these reed beds um, down there this winter for the first time which is absolutely superb and um, we've done other things uh, on Falshaw to do with this uh, restoration we reintroduced this beautiful uh, dragonfly the white faced data and um, only um, really left at one extant site in Cumbria, in the north of Cumbria, but it was a species that was known on Falshaw before Chap Falshaw was planted up with trees in the 1950s. So, uh, so we reintroduced this species. It was, it was declining on the one site uh, where it was left and it's done fantastically well. And because we created all this wonderful uh, pond habitat with all these cells around the edge of Falshaw, then, um, it's been a real success and the white faced dot appears to be thriving on those edge habitats around Falshaw and Meathop. Uh, we can't really mention Falshaw without mentioning the ospreys and basically um, we started seeing ospreys uh, showing interest in nesting at Falshaw in uh, as far back as 2013 and we used to get um, we used to get um late summer uh, ospreys uh, passing through and hanging out and pretending to build nests so we put a platform up and we put some cameras up and the rest really is just history because it's been the most uh, wonderful uh, success um that was the first the cameras and the first um nest platform we put up and uh, this the, uh, this was a qu quite amazing feat as well because we not the royal we again uh, dragged two kilometers of armored cable out onto the bog uh, to be able to bring um, these uh, these pictures into people's homes. And this has been a fantastic uh, thing for people over lockdown who've been following our webcams. Uh, 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 just a wonderful thing to bring into your living room. 
and and also we have to say a great thanks to the neighbours who let us plug into their um, into their internet because without them and their electricity because without them without them we wouldn't be able to bring you the pictures either and it's been a fantastic success these were the first uh, three uh, chicks that fledged I'll I'll whiz through some of these because uh, there's a few there and um, and this is the chicks uh, being brought down and uh, ringed as they are um in the summer each season and and this has been a great success as well because uh, that's them being embarrassed by being weighed uh, and there they are again and with these tags with these large um uh colored rings they can be spotted and our ospreys have been spotted in spain and in the gambia in africa and it, and we can follow our chicks when our chicks go to other sites and start breeding at other sites so uh been a fantastic success uh, some of the new things that have been happening at uh, Falshaw. Falshaw has been a bit difficult because of the uh, COVID restrictions and we've had to close the viewing platform, but we've still got a one-way system going around uh, the boardwalk. Uh, this is the um, the new Osprey viewing uh, station um, that we put up uh, last year. We put this new feeding station up. You can go and watch um, Siskin and Red Pole and Tree Sparrow at the feeding station, and that's been a fantastic success as well. Right, um, so up in the north of the county, we also have a rather large peat bog, and this is uh, Drumbruff moss. Um, Drumbruff moss, we purchased a large part of uh, Drumbruff in 1981, and it's still one of our largest reserves. And we own about 65% of it, unlike Falshaw where, and Meathop, where we own pretty much all the bog, and therefore we can do this fantastic restoration work. However, um, Drumbruff uh, starts from a much better place. It's got beautiful bog vegetation on it, but however, it has been messed about with on the edges. Uh, um, it still needed the same kinds of restoration work as uh, we did for Falshaw and Meathop. So we had to find a way of doing that. And the only way you can do that on these uh, uh, peat bodies is to get everybody involved. So a very quick map. The orange shows uh, what we own and the other colors are all the other owners and um we went and with the help of natural england and the farming and wildlife advisory group and talked to all the different owners and got everybody involved so that we could uh, do the same kind of work as we did at falshaw uh, on drumbruff uh, to try to help keep the water in the middle of drumbruff like we did on those other bogs and it's been again been a fantastic success 10 years old uh, coming up to this coming year um and we did the same thing. These are some nice uh, photos that a volunteer took. Uh, it wasn't plantation, but there was a lot of secondary woodland had come in onto the drier peat areas. So there was uh, woodland taken away from um, the, the, the fringe, the woodland fringe. Um, and that's uh, where they chipped uh, a lot of the brush to get rid of it. And we got a lot of plant on site again, big diggers. And we did the same thing. We reprofiled the peat faces and we did the bunding the bunding where you're getting the good peat from down below, the, the, uh, the peat that stops the flow of the water and then filling in these trenches and creating these pools around the edge. And again, uh, it's been a fantastic success at Drumbruff, but we couldn't have done it without our neighbours. Drumbruff, like I said, started from a better place. So um, it had all three species of uh, uh, native species of sundew on it already. And, uh, and hopefully um, this is just helping uh, to keep the bog in great condition uh, into the future. Uh, we've also got these wonderful Exmoor ponies. Uh, there's, there's one part of, of, of the peat uh, body there that is, um, that is separated from the rest of the bog by an old railway line. And these boat ponies do a fantastic job of uh, looking after the vegetation on that cut over area that is, um, that is cut off from the rest of the bog. Um, we've had some great uh, things going on um, again uh, in terms of visitor infrastructure. This was a new viewing platform that was put in the other year and get these beautiful views over the whole extent of the bog. And Kevin and his, um, and his volunteers set about a Sisyphean task of putting in this wonderful boardwalk. He got this idea and he bought these old secondhand sleepers um, which just float on the bog surface. And him and his volunteers... Um, worked tirelessly this is before covid obviously with them all being so close worked tirelessly um to create this wonderful uh, boardwalk which allows you to to walk uh, and get the experience of going across the bog surface 
here you can see as it starts to develop these were the three main volunteers who really without these three uh kevin wouldn't have been able to do this job at all and they were just uh, wonderful in giving their time and energy up because it was a hell of a task and here you can see it from from the air and this this leads across the bog um surface and to the to the viewing platform um other new things at drumbrook we've just had a bird hide put in poor kevin had a bird hide put in and immediately had to lock it up because of covid restrictions so hopefully the bird hide is going to be open again soon and we can manage it either um once we've got over the over the whole covid restrictions thing and uh, and we're back to more normal or we can find a way of managing it so that we can have one person in one end and one person in the other with a mask on. So uh, that, that's new and happening at Drumbruff at this very moment. We've also had a uh, new interpretation put in uh, this autumn and we've put in an Osprey platform in the hope that we can uh, manage to um, tempt them in. This is Kevin's dream. Um, I'm just going to talk about Icot Hill, really, because I can't uh, I, um, I can't do a reserves talk without talking about Icot, uh, a fantastic project where we were we 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 got the opportunity um, to buy a large piece of the uplands, and we'd never really had a true uh, upland reserve before, uh, not a real fell uh, type reserve. And uh, this uh, this was six years ago. Um, Icot was a beautiful place. Uh, designated as a, as, as, a, as a nationally important site for its geology, but also for its wonderful uh, Myers. In fact, geology wise, it's the only place, um, as far as I know, where the Icot Volcanics uh, actually um, actually outcrop. So it's the type location um, for the geology there. And, and the geology and the, um, the topography formed by the geology has these, um, that's just showing the geology with Blancathra in the background, uh, it forms this wonderful series of uh, Myers um, that uh, I think uh, you can see here, these wonderful Myers, these basin Myers, because of this uh, geology that is formed um, by these uh, tilted um, volcanic rocks. Um, we've been trying to do uh, special things on, on ICA and we've been trying to uh, demonstrate, what well, we, we've been trying to demonstrate a new a new type of farming whereby where where a lot of sheep were grazed on there before um, and it was grazed um quite heavily quite heavily in in, in our eyes and um, we've tried to bring in a much more sustainable type um, grazing regime firstly we did this with our neighbor at newton rig and then more recently um with the with these two fellows who put their uh, belted galloway uh, organic herd on and basically this is a um this is a, a, a low input, um, extensive grazing scheme, trying to bring uh, the flora and uh, the fauna back onto the fell, but while also producing um, quality meat and producing a herd that looks after itself. So, so this is a, a herd that now um, calves on the fell um, and, um, and hopefully um, we're gonna see a sustainable Galloway herd um grazing on icot into the future um we we got some other land with icot we got some enclosed land up uh, at the barrier end and uh we set off first of all so uh two things one was reinstating a more sustainable grazing system the other was to look after um what used to be a whole series of fields and was just being ranched as one great big field so first of all we went and we split it back up into its original fields and uh, we put back in the grazing infrastructure so that we can move the cattle about um, and we started to reinstate some of the boundaries uh, where we got beautiful ancient hawthorns were the only thing left out of these uh, old hedges between the fields and we also decided to try to to uh, to recreate uh, the meadows that would have been there before um, before and uh, the uh, intensive farming had kind of got over them so so we actually took um, the, um green hay from uh, famous uh, meadows in the eden valley Bowerhead and piper hole and here uh, this is uh, a power power harrowing of the field 
and then spreading of the green hay to try to inoc inoculate some of the species that should have been there, that would have been there, that you can see on the roadside verges next to uh, Icot Hill, uh, to try and get them back into uh, into the field. And this has just been a, uh, here's some uh, young lads helping with planting plugs as well to get these species back. And it's been the most wonderful success. Um, and yeah, uh, really quite incredible the amount of species and uh, and uh, some of the best meadow restoration I've ever seen. Um, not all, not all of it. Not all of it uh, um, is 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 taking um, the the restoration in the same way. It depends a lot on the chemical on the chemical um, up, uh, up, uh, makeup of the soil, but uh, some of it has been the most fantastically uh, uh, successful restoration. Um, we also did some other things. We decided to try to get some trees back onto Icot. So we planted alder woodland, we planted oak woodland, we planted clough woodland um, along the stream sides and here. And we've tried to restore heathland where, where the heather and the bilberry had just been grazed down to absolutely nothing and missing from most of the sward. Uh, and here you can see some of the tree planting has been a fantastic success. And, uh, and he's doing really well. And there's lots of that still going on, even though the project the funded project, the six, basically best part of six year project ended at the end of, of the summer. Uh, we've had, it's been a wonderful project for getting people involved as well. This is one of the early um, bio blitz days that we had where we were uh, getting lots and lots of volunteers and, and keen people to go out and try to have a look what we actually had on, on ICOT. Um, we've had loads of children involved. This is, was a storytelling um, event that we had early on. And, and we had the wonderful, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. <laughs> we had these wonderful children uh, who, who did this per, uh, peripatetic play across uh, ICOT, um, which was, again, a fantastic success. Um, and, and, and the whole thing ended up with this wonderful um, conference that we had literally uh, in the March time, February, March time, just before um, COVID came along and ruined everything for us. And when we were still allowed to all get in the one room together. And that's Tony Juniper as head of Natural England um, talking to um, a crowd of people about the successes that we've had at ICOP. And there's a wonderful picture of orchids in one of the bogs at ICOT. Uh, I know I was going to tell you about some of the um, some of the stats. I had some stats written down here. We've planted uh, over 10,000 trees. We've restored six hectares of hay meadows. Volunteers have contributed 1,200 days and we've delivered 47 skills courses to over 500 people. Um, we've reached 1,200 people with 173 art workshops. And We've had more than three and a half thousand people have engaged with nature across the 233 events that we've had. And over 28,000 people have visited Icot Hill as a nature reserve uh, since we took it over, which I think is just a fantastic success. Well, I'm just going to take a quick drink. I'm going to move on to uh, Woodland now, and this is a little, um, little visited site by uh, many of our members. And this is just outside of... Um, Carlisle, this is Orton Moss. Orton Moss was a peat bog um, and, uh, and had been cut over and drained and uh, woodland had been allowed to, to grow over it. And it is now the most wonderful uh, wet woodland site, wet woodland being a, a priority habitat and a very rare habitat. Now this C1 here, this first stint was our first uh, part of our reserve called Bucknell's Field. And it was originally um, bought with money given to us by Canon Bucknell in 1964. And uh, this was actually, this is on the edge of the woodland, and it's a wet grassland site. Um, and this was, so this was our first uh, stint. We then acquired C2 and C3, which we leased uh, from English Nature. And then later on, and more during my time, um, we had the opportunity to purchase these other bits of woodland. Now, uh, we're still, as you can see, uh, got these huge gaps between them. So, so what we did was we set about trying to find out, oh, and this is a, an idea of um, what it's kind of like in, in Orton Moss, a lot of it. It's, uh, it's fantastic. It's like, I always think of it as being like the bayou um, in Florida, except cold and without the alligators. Um, and 
uh, we set about trying to find out who owned the bits in between and we found uh, a couple of owners and we've since leased their sites and the other thing we started to do as well was to was to um was to clear uh, some of this area uh, and turn it back to wet grassland so this is, was what used to be wet grassland in the 1901 um maps of the site and uh, these are some of kevin's photos of us uh, clearing that woodland edge uh, uh, with volunteers and turning some of that back into a wet grassland where we put back in grazing infrastructure we got susan agley and these beautiful longhorn cattle uh, to graze the site we've been planting devil's bit scabious on these areas uh, with the hope that we would be able to attract back the marsh fritillary which is uh, known from the site in the past and is only down uh, down the road at Finglandry. we also have uh, willow tits on site uh, that's a very quick uh, uh, whiz through that piece of woodland uh, some of the woodlands that we manage uh, in the south of the county we also manage for their invertebrate uh, interest and these are the high brown fritillaries and these are at my site uh, at How Ridding Wood and How Ridding Wood um, has been managed um, as a coppiced woodland um, for nearly 30 years now and it's probably one of the biggest um, coppiced woodland sites uh, in the northwest of England. We coppice about half a hectare of woodland each year and that woodland is, is then left open and for all the uh, for all the woodland flowers and especially the violets that these uh, fertility species love uh, to thrive with an open canopy and then we fence the coops off and they're allowed to uh, allowed to grow back and we create this wonderful mosaic of uh, age classes uh, throughout the woodland and um, not only do we have high brown fertility on this site we also have pearl border facility dark green fertility and um silver washed and all of those fertility species all rely their caterpillars rely on on violets and you can see here the beautiful uh, wild daffodils starting to come through and every time we cut a new coop uh, the wild daffodils uh, thrive uh, and then to to disappear as the as the woodland becomes established again um the, uh, this is a bit of a, a difficult slide this just shows this one two three four five this shows our uh, coppice mosaic and how we coppice in a checkerboard fashion and um, so, uh, so that we don't leave large areas of, of uh, woodland uh, of any single age group uh, next to one another. And it's on, a, on just short of a 20 year rotation and it's all coppiced on either side of this beautiful flat uh, ride. And this ride uh, that runs down the middle creates a, a wonderful um, sunny sheltered area for the butterflies. Uh, and lots of other species uh, to get uh, between the different coppice coops and the different uh, age classes of woodland. These, uh, these, the, these coppice coops as well, once they're fenced, they produce this wonderful uh, woodland edge effect, which we don't get in many places where, as you can see behind this fella, where, where they chock up with bramble. Uh, and we really get this, this kind of dense uh, regrowth. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of grasslands. I, I realise it's getting on and I've still got quite a lot to do, so I'm going to whisk through some of these. I'm going to talk about a couple of grassland sites and then I'm going to talk about some of the new things that have been happening uh, across our reserves. This is Clint's quarry and Clint's is a, an old quarry that was threatened with landfill in 1986. And we were, um, we were able to save it from becoming a, a, a dump. And it's always been known as a fantastic site for its orchids. Um, you can see here this wonderful limestone grass, and it's quite a difficult site to manage. It's quite small. Um, it's uh, it's close to, uh, more. It's closer to an urban area than than lots of our reserves, and uh, and it kind of gets a bit of a problem with um, uh, with that. But uh, we've put a lot of effort and time into trying to ensure uh, the safekeeping of this uh, wonderful grassland. And, and it's always been famous for its bee orchids. And you can see on the right hand side, this is a bit of a Clint's quarry speciality variation. Uh, and this used to be the, the most northerly site for bee orchids uh, uh, in Cumbria, which have now spread up the West Coast. And I've heard that there's quite a lot of bee orchids around uh, Maryport and other places now, but often on these uh, old spoil sites, uh, like on the floor of Clint's quarry. Uh, Clint's is also uh, uh, nationally important for its geology as well. Uh, and has some quite uh, remarkable um, fossils 
Um, not that I've necessarily noticed them. They're supposed to be fossilized algae, uh, which I find quite difficult to find. Um, we've done quite a bit uh, in Clint's over the past few years in terms of reserve infrastructure um, for the public, uh, for um, interpretation, but also for allowing us to get grazing animals onto the site and being able to, because it's, uh, like I said, it's a really difficult uh, site. And, and um, hopefully this winter, we're going to get, be getting uh, two or three fell ponies uh, onto Clint's, um, who, which should do a wonderful job of keeping uh, the scrub down and uh, keeping uh, the grassland in really good condition. Um, one of the other things that we are fantastically well endowed with at Cumbo Wildlife Trust is beautiful, wonderful areas of limestone grassland uh, in Hutton Roof and Whitbarrow uh, and Brown Robin. Uh, and this is uh, our reserve up at Hutton Roof. Um, these sites are quite difficult to manage as well because they're these wonderful mosaics. Not only are they wonderful grassland and scrubland with areas of juniper, but they've got this wonderful uh, limestone pavement and finding a way to manage these to stop them all turning to woodland and um, is 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 uh, and keeping the, the iconic species on them is quite difficult and we we uh, we had a lot of problems um getting people to graze these sites and finding somebody who would put uh, their animals expensive animals on a site uh, which looked like this and you know most farmers would uh, would run a mile from and we found eventually we found a grazier who uh, who was willing to do that but uh, actually on Hutton Roof we put our hand in our pocket and invested in the first eight animals uh, to come and graze that site and and those eight animals even though they've changed over the years are still ours and are managed by a different grazier now even but they still do a wonderful job in uh, in grazing the grassland between the reserves keeping the scrub uh, between the pavements keeping the scrub down but also getting onto the pavement and grazing on the pavement as well um, I'd just like to uh, go through a few of the things that have been happening lately. This is the Smart Ale to Weightby link. That's not that new, but it's still fairly new to us. Well, we've been able to uh, link the wonderful reserve at, uh, at Smart Ale Gill um, to uh, our Weightby Green Rigs Reserve, which are both on the same railway line. So we, will be we were able to purchase the, uh, the line in between and link them up. And this also solved our car parking problems that we were having <coughs> in getting people to our reserve and we were able to build this wonderful new car park on this new piece of railway line uh, linking the two reserves and um, we've put paths for all so there's paths that uh, are pushchair and wheelchair friendly uh, all the way from um, the car park now all the way uh, to the viaduct at South Walney and hopefully uh, this winter, it's been put on hold because it got very wet, but hopefully this winter we're going to be able to extend that uh, path for all all the way to the new beginning end of South Wally Nature Reserve, giving about four, four or five miles of uh, wonderful level um, access for all path so everybody can enjoy South Wally. Uh, this is the boardwalk uh, that takes you out of that bit and into the village. And uh, this is some of the new interpretation and the new interpretation cabins that went up. Uh, by the new car park and this has been become a fantastic place uh, for, for spotting red squirrels at the feeding station there so uh, really worth a, a, a visit if you get the chance. Um, and we have had our problems on South uh, Smardale this year um, mainly because um, because the, the uh, viaduct was uh, deemed to be unsafe because of the, the railings so uh, the Northern Viaduct Trust shut uh, um, the viaduct for quite a while and but luckily uh, we've been able to get over that now and this uh, new uh, grating has been put up on either side and the uh, the viaduct is open again so so now people can get across the viaduct and like i said from the viaduct all the way to new Biggin, we hope to very soon uh, have a new um, level surfaced path all the way uh, Loic common is another fantastic uh, acquisition that's come to us recently you can see why my talk just gets bigger and bigger and bigger we buy all these uh, or we um get acquire all these new beautiful nature reserves so loic loic was the by far and away the biggest gift of land uh, that the trust had ever had over um 100 hectares it's a wonderful site 
it, it's had a bit of neglect and it's got a, a lot of bracken on it, but it's a wonderful site for its mires and for its tarns. It's one of the few sites across uh, South Cumbria that holds good populations um, of medicinal leech. It's great for its farmland birds and it has about 14 species of, of dragonfly um, in these ponds. And, and, and one thing that I found when we first went to visit was a, a breeding colony of yellowhammers, which I really don't see um, very often these days, which was uh, wonderful to see. Um, we were also able to uh, purchase craggy wood uh, recently. Um, and this, uh, as, a, as an extension to our wonderful reserve, uh, Dorothy Ferris, the blue is Dorothy Ferris, the green is craggy wood, which the National Park uh, was selling off. And we joined with the people of Staveley uh, to help them to raise the money to be able to buy craggy. And that is now um, under our management. And then we, um, we are hoping to be able to plant a woodland corridor um, uh, that's going to link uh, on this red land here, uh, that's going to link the two woods. Now, that, that, uh, that's been put on hold a little bit over the summer uh because of uh covid and because of furloughing of staff but hopefully um we're, we're, we're going to see that project um spring back into life uh, over the next few months and this was uh when we eventually were able to take um charge of the land uh with the good people of staveley uh who helped us uh, to raise the money and it's not champagne if any of you think it might be uh, and and um, very quickly, um, we've also, th this has just happened in the last year and just happened before lockdown came about, we were gifted a wonderful farm in the Eden Valley, just uh, south of Kirby Stephen in Ravenstonedale at Bowberhead. And I, I mentioned Bowberhead earlier in that um, green hay was taken from Bowberhead and Piper Hole Meadows. These Bowberhead and Piper Hole hay meadows are some of the most <coughs> famous uh, hay meadows in northwest england and we were uh, uh we were very fortunate uh, to be gifted uh bowberhead um from a family uh, in in their will um it's our newest acquisition it comes with the farmhouse and the farm buildings um and like i said it comes with um 12 hectares of um uh, triple SI quality um, hay meadow, northern hay meadow, um, absolute, absolutely superb. And even uh, even with COVID, we we were able to uh, get a team of volunteers, um, socially distanced, obviously, uh, out there over the summer uh, to really take stock of, of what we got with Bowberhead, and uh, and they did a fantastic job in um, in going field by field, um, recording all the plants finding where all the rarities were, finding uh, the bits that weren't as quite as good as we thought they might be. Uh, and, and we're going to set about um, restoring all the fields that aren't up to the quality that we feel that they ought to be. And, and finding wherever we think uh, the species are missing, because some species that do seem to be missing, uh, that have been recorded in the past, and trying to, trying to um, restore them back to their former glory. And hopefully we will have... Um, access uh, to these meadows uh, for this coming uh, flowering season uh, all being well and uh, and covid restrictions being okay and uh, and everybody will be able to see uh, what wonderful places they are with these fantastic iconic species uh, of um, hay rattle and of um, wood cranes bill we've also got um, melancholy thistle and lots of ladies mantles and greater burnet some brilliant uh, limestone banks as well with wonderful uh, fragrant orchids. And uh, yeah, um, re like I said, restoration planned for across all the fields of the farm. Um, this was uh, hay time this year uh, when the farmers uh, managed to take hay from there. This is, this is which managed at the moment with the help of the two, two neighboring farmers. And here is, uh, it was being small baled uh, and stored in the beautiful hay barns that are um, that are very much iconic uh, to this part of the world. Um, okay, so I just want to finish by um, talking a bit about um, nature reserves in general. This is this isn't the best picture. Sorry, uh, we're used to very quality pictures these days. This is Hale Moss, and Hale Moss is uh, one of our nature reserves on the A6, just across the way from Wildlife Oasis. 
in the south of the county. And Hale Moss is the most phenomenal piece of habitat. That's um, this is this is the habitat that's left, and it's a it's this wonderful uh, black bog rush uh, mire with bird's eye primrose and, and other special species. And it's incredibly rare. It's incredibly rare in Cumbria. Um, it's a site of special scientific interest, nationally important, but it's absolutely tiny. And really, uh, it, um, this is there because it, uh, it, it's over an old Marl Lake. And really, lots of these other fields round about would have had the same vegetation um, in them. And, and, and a reserve like this is incredibly difficult to manage. A reserve like this is incredibly difficult to keep um all those iconic species there you know in this in this kind of uh, agricultural desert around it and um, so nature reserves play a ridiculously important part in trying to keep hold of what we've got but we need to do more than that we can't just hold on to postage stamp areas like hail mass what we need to do is we need to think big and we need to try to expand those areas now this is a this is an old slide and it's of an old project from down south um, in Lincolnshire, which is the Great Fen project where they had the same thing, where they had um, very small areas of, of Fenland and of semi-natural habitat. But they had a great vision and they had a real vision to try to think what it could be like if we could join these these habitats up, if um, if we could start to spread this Fenland habitat across these peat soils, which are now you know, um, uh, just down to agriculture with very little worth for wildlife. And, 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 and they, they looked into putting this vision into, um, um, in, uh, into being by, by approaching the landowners, by saying, can we buy these bits? And this was the, the vision that they saw in the future where they could uh, link up all these bits of land. And, and really, we can do the same. Um, this slide here shows the 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 Witherslack um, area at the bottom of the Lyth Valley and the red is our reserves. This is Falshaw, this is Meathop, this is uh, Nichols Moss, Latterbarrow, Howridin, and and Whitbarrow, um, and the blue shows all the internationally important sites. So all of these sites are internationally important, including the river, including the Kent, and including the limestone of of Scoutscar and Helsington Barrows, and then. Uh, the green is ancient semi-natural woodland and the pink here is uh, National Trust owned land. And lots of this land up here is also uh, publicly owned by the Forestry Commission. And I think what we need to do is we'll, what we need to do is think about uh, uh, these nature recovery networks where we can we can we can rely on these isolated areas of land, but try to join them up, do the things that we've been doing down at Falshaw and at Meathop where we've been where we've been turning what what has become um agricultural land with with no uh, worth for wildlife and trying to uh, re-establish um nature across the landscape rather than than just in these little pockets on our reserves that said there's nothing beats a good nature reserve this is bonus on solway um right up in the north of the county uh, an old gravel pit surrounded by intensive agriculture and it's just a wonderful haven for wildlife it has willow tit it's got fantastic uh, numbers of willow warblers it's got 20 species of butterfly it's got 15 species of dragonfly and it's got great crested newt so that's me thank you very much um if anybody's got any questions, like I, uh, I'm going to have to come out of this because I can't actually see anything. If anybody's got any questions uh, and they've been fed through to um, to Andrea or uh, Mel on the chat, I'm very willing to take some questions. Andrea? Questions. Uh, David has okay. asked, given you describe Falshaw partly as fen. Is it feasible to introduce swallowtail butterfly like Wickham Fen in Cambridgeshire? Maybe, or is it too cold or um, wet for them? Um, I, 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 to tell you the truth, I don't know anything about the swallowtail butterfly. I've, I, I'm afraid I've done all my ecology up in the northwest of England. Um, so uh, I. I, I don't know whether uh, we would have the same extent of Fenland habitat, even though we're after 
uh, recreating this lag fen where we where it, um, where where the vegetation is much more influenced by the runoff um, from the surrounding land as opposed to the bog, which is all uh, from precipitation. And um, so, uh, I would have said two factors. One, could we recreate the the extensive fenland type habitat that uh, uh, from the fens? I, and I really don't know. And also. Um, whether uh, climate change would allow for a species that is primarily a, a southern species. I hope that answers your question, David. Okay, Joe, we have another question from Karen, who's asked what our criteria are for accepting land as a nature reserve. Uh, okay, so we have quite a strict uh, reserves acquisition policy um, because um in in the past historically um and uh, not by any means we didn't want any <laughs> but, uh, but i think we've accepted uh, uh, like like i said it's very difficult uh, to manage very small isolated um pieces of land so so um the the reserves acquisition criteria at the moment is about quality uh, so it has to be of quality and it also has to be of a, of a, of a viable size to be able to uh, to ensure management into the future, so um, so uh, but both of those really. Um, but I did hear uh, very recently um, of I was reading something about um, I think it was Worcestershire Wildlife Trust, and they are um, they've got this fantastic idea of targeting um, agricultural land with with no wildlife interest, and then trying to trying to turn that into um back into in into a wildlife haven and and I, th I think that's a really interesting take on it so so um our our reserves acquisition policy uh, isn't set in stone and it might well change into the future but 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 um i mean we're always looking at bigger and better and more joined up is the thing Have that answered your question, Karen? We have a question from Nigel, though, who's asked if, um, if there's plans to provide access for the public um, for the wetland at the south end of Falshore. Um, I'd love to provide uh, public access uh, to the wetland at um, at Ulfa, but I'm afraid um, it, it was part of the planning conditions when we got the planning permission to be able to to do the earthworks and um, to wet that area up and um, it was implicit within that that we couldn't actually uh, allow public access down there so i, I don't know when that might uh, change and um, we do allow access by permit but that's limited to a certain number of uh, people every year has asked um for the good references for the site with bird's eye primroses so the grid reference i don't <laughs> okay we can supply that's that. great thank you very much we'll uh, we'll get that over to you amanda and um a question just from sheila who's asked if there's an update regarding the camera on the osprey nest Uh, yeah, so um, we are, uh, Paul and Rob are working very hard to try to ensure that we have the best, um, the best camera uh, for, for, uh, for next season and there will be a camera back up. We, um, they, I know they are looking into some quite, um, quite uh, innovative uh, ways of being able to um, uh, spread the um, um the uh the the live footage so so we will have a camera it will be back up i'm afraid yeah uh, we've had to replace both the cameras because uh, uh because they've both gone down but they have been there there a few years now but uh but we might even come up with uh, some even more exciting stuff for this year that's it for questions unless anybody wants to quickly post another Nope, I think that's it um, for questions. If there's anything more, then do email us and we'll we'll follow up. Yeah, and uh, thank you all very much for coming and joining us on this uh, 
Dartmoor evening, and I hope uh, you all enjoyed the talk. Thank you.